Yeah, so, so I'm Lewis. And I'm Jane. And so we're both part of Assemble, and it's a collective of, of 15 people. Um, we're based in London. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was through that that the, the, a kind of a, a real kind of shared ethos and way of working developed. Um, that a lot of us had studied architecture together, but in a sense, you know, those kind of four weeks building something together there were a much more formative experience than the three years we had in formal education. Um, and it was through that kind of shared experience that Assemble started. Well, so, so, so we had decided, you know, we had, we had noticed these empty petrol stations around London, you know, a few of them, and, and saw them as a, as a great kind of place to, 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 kind of to, to develop a project, an idea that could be based around this typology with, which has so many associations, um, and something which could kind of be subverted or, um, um, you know, be kind of reappropriated for more, more public use. So we came up with a kind of initial uh, kind of pamphlet which, which describes the idea and the ambition. And we took it to the, um, the, the person who owned that site, but also to other petrol stations. Um, but they were the only ones who, um, the ones owned by Texaco did not listen to us. <laughs> um, but this one yeah, had been bought by a developer for, for, um, to redevelop this kind of mixed use housing scheme, which has been put on hold because of the, the recession. Um, and you know, he was, he was very open to, to, like, hearing what we had to say. <laughs> um, I think there's, um, there's the, I suppose, that, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of themes in, in, in our work about kind of, um, kind of involving a lot of people in the development of projects and that kind of more socially engaged model of practice, which feel like they do have a lot in, in common with um, a lot of models of, of practice and of work from, you know, the 60s and 70s. And so it's actually, you know, it's really interesting to, 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 to kind of see those links um, <laughs> because, you know, they're not necessarily um, kind of conscious relations that, that you know, that, that yeah. we're necessarily always aware of. Um, but I think there's just a cycle to these things, and their, you know, their ideas and approaches which are relevant now as they, as they have been in, in the past. Mm. It's kind of quite interesting seeing the different projects here and how a lot of them are about new ways of thinking about architecture or engaging the public. And I think what's quite interesting, maybe what we also try to do is, is not just focus on how, you know, kind of design process or how a project's made, but also about how we work together. And so, you know, sort of the title of our talk yesterday is Collective Practice. So I think there's that kind of additional layer of how do people kind of who, who have some sort of formal training, who are technically considered more professional than maybe others, but also recognize the sort of kind of joy of being an amateur um, and want to embrace that, how, how, how are those connections made between between people, so it's sort of really interesting seeing all this kind of archival stuff of letters between people and how how things came to be made, as well as the work they did here. I think it's also interesting looking at these, um, you know, these these models from the past and and how, especially with the um, you know with the internet and the kind of connectivity across the, the world that we kind of enjoy today, how how in, in the future, you know, you hope they can become um, more kind of common and more known models of practice. Um, I think certainly the way that, that we work and the way that we've been able to, to kind of communicate and gather people together around certain projects and kind of areas has been totally, like, you know, amazingly facilitated by, by the internet. And certainly I think um, that's something which makes you kind of hopeful for, for the for the future in terms of these kind of, more of yeah yeah you know and it's, and it's in a sense it's amazing you know to, to be here you know like the other side of the world and you know talking about these these kind of shared themes and values yeah and, so many people are interested yeah yeah whereas i think you know certainly it seems like um a lot of the examples in the exhibition from 
in the 60s and 70s, they are, they're, they're, they're much more focused to a particular kind of, um, lo you know, location or scene or kind of um, more local set of values. Um, but there are obviously these links between them. Well, I think um, people spend, you know, depending on the projects that they're working on, what they're doing, spend an enormously kind of varied amount of time in the office. And when, you know, some projects have already involved people, you know, moving away essentially for, for several months or, you know, for a prolonged period of time to, to kind of help set up and kind of enable that, that project to happen in, in another location. Um, so it, in, in, in that sense, I, I don't think it's, it's hugely um, different. But I think I'm, you know, definitely aware, personally, of how much um, you know we'll kind of gain from each other's company and the more kind of informal exchanges around projects that happen by sharing the same space. So um, whilst you know I'll be in, I'll live, be living in Liverpool, I'll still be spending a day or two a week in London. Um, and so every, yeah, every Monday we have we kind of review all of the projects. Um, and so I'll be there on, on Mondays. <laughs> be there on crucial days, to get your opinion yeah. heard. Yeah. But people come and go, and, and there are some people who are full-time working in for other practices, and then they'll come maybe to a kind of weekly evening meeting that we do where we actually review projects. And it's quite nice because they also have this slightly more objective opinion um, where they haven't been in the office every day and haven't heard everything. So they're able to be like, well, guys, <laughs> what, are you, <laughs> what are you doing? Um, so also, sometimes that distance is, is quite helpful to the, to the group. Yeah. Um, yeah. S certainly, that was a really great thing about um, uh, when uh, about half of the group went to continue their education and doing kind of masters and part twos and then kind of came back in. And there's a whole new kind of whole new frames of references and a, a kind of divergence of interests which have you know, really kind of re-energized everything. So that was... I, did, I went back in 2011. So we just finished the folly in 2011. So we just done our second project. And then quite a few of us all went to do our part twos, which is a two-year course. Um, so in 2013, kind of over that Christmas, that's also when we redid the office and really had this like quite formal space to to work in and be in regularly, and that's kind of when everyone sort of began to think more seriously about trying to pursue assemble-type work more kind of as a full-time occupation. There, there are kind of, um, so there are 15 people at the moment who's kind of, probably like their, their primary occupation is assemble, but I guess I don't know whether, with you, whether you think there is that I don't I don't know I suppose it depends how you you know based on like if it was based on like numbers of projects then probably assemble wouldn't be my main thing because my PhD is such a big project in itself yeah. but then you know I, so I'm only really on like one or two very small projects at a time but then in terms of like time spent I'm at assemble yeah. like three or four days a week which is potentially actually more than those who are teaching two days a week or you know the people who are off kind of, you know, in Liverpool or Bristol or Glasgow doing other projects. So it's, it's kind of really hard to tell and definitely, you know, sort of as we were saying yesterday, the teaching and the PhD. <laughs> um, uh, the, to the teaching and doing PhDs are not completely independent practices. They are completely based and intertwined with projects that are being pursued um, in Assemble. The only person who is full-time 100% Assemble is Karim, who does our finances. Uh, and, well, Alice is... Mm. Yeah, and Alice, I suppose, yeah. But everyone else is teaching. And Louis, maybe Louis. Louis, well, yeah. he other, yeah. I mean, it, I think it, it, it's important to us that there's room for individuals yeah. to pursue their own interests outside of Assemble as well. Um, because it, it does help kind of broaden the conversation. Um, and also, assemble can't cater for you know for for, for everything. Yeah, mm. but it's also that I mean, there's such a range of projects. Like our kind of goldsmith project is is huge, and the people running that, are, you know, sort of very formally working on it full time, 
running this big building job, whereas um, you know the smaller stuff, um, kind of exhibitions and and smaller like art commissions, are just as much kind of important bits of work, but have very different kind of commitments in terms of um, sort of time and how much resources they take from the rest of the office. Um, so, so yeah, next month, well, in two months, we're going away for the weekend somewhere in Scotland um, uh, to sort of discuss some of the sort of bigger issues that have come up kind of as a result of doing projects to try and have some space to actually talk about how we manage work, how we might do things in the future. But we have, we have done it before, but more as a kind of, you know, sort of one-off evening meeting and it's quite difficult to try and talk about these things um, when also it's a more day-to-day -day thing so it was, I think it's going to be really good to like physically separate ourselves from our space and kind of also remind ourselves of the fact that we are <laughs> kind of essentially a group of friends who want to continue doing work together um, and so the summit isn't sort of just about those sort of you know boring how do we make this work? But, but also some of those maybe like a kind of place to just ask some of those questions or test some of those ideas about what could happen next. Yeah, I think we've, we've, we've started the conversation many times before and covered different parts of it. Um, but, you know, an evening or a day isn't, isn't long enough to, to kind of to have the whole, the full discussion really. And so, it's going to be. Well, that's it's why. Weekend. We, it's not going to be like a whole <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> year. Um, but yeah, I mean, it has been like enormously helpful having those discussions and and really working on improving the way yeah. that we work together. I think you can kind of forget that actually a lot of work or the work that we do is actually more about conversation, or should be. It's very easy to get carried away with like doing projects and you know having to just get the work done and then only talking about your work in an allocated you know like hour or something and a lot of um, kind of groups and the ones you sort of see here at this exhibition as well are really foregrounded by the convers that you know they, the work grew out of really interesting conversations between people um, and so I think it's really good for us to try and get back to that a bit and just be able to have these conversations that don't necessarily have to have an outcome that can not be leading anywhere in particular but I think in like inevitably when a conversation gets too small the group that's having a conversation gets too small then it does resort to kind of jargon and codified language and I think because we've always tried to have a, a you know a broad conversation involve lots of people in projects you know that's i suppose that that's hopefully you know prevented that from happening um, i think in the first instance with our first project it it was sort of in a way done a little bit with a kind of naivety where the you know in the uk everything is very dictated by a kind of hierarchy and we were very much not you know, at the very beginning of, let's say, a kind of architectural career. So in a way, I think a lot of us didn't necessarily, you know, relatively, we only had three years experience even having anything to do with architecture. So I don't think we really particularly felt like we were kind of in the field, contributing our perspective to some kind of huge conversation and therefore able to do that in a way that was kind of, I don't know, organized at all um, and um, but you sort of realize that the actions kind of, of doing something and making something physical even if it is temporary and a test um, actually like resonated so well with kind of a public but also practitioners um, and in a way through doing more projects we've developed a, a voice <laughs> but um, I don't think it was it's particularly done you know as a kind of um, to oppose other kind of conversations that are, are happening. Um, we, we certainly don't like um, consciously edit or censor the way that we speak. Um, 
you know, to try and make it more um, plain, <laughs> you know. Um. But there are 15 of us, so we, you don't feel you have to because, you know, someone else is going to go and say something completely different yeah. and, and that might contradict, <laughs> yeah, what's already been said. So I think that could be quite confusing for others, but it's also definitely a nice way to kind of be able to just have your say about a project and not feel like you're representing Assemble and that Assemble must have some sort of manifesto with sort of quite, not necessarily kind of avoided, but never felt that a kind of manifesto was something that we would need um, or that would be helpful and that the work itself should, should speak about those issues and the next piece of work might speak about the same issues or different issues and, and also the people that have made them. Um, and so, you know, it's a kind of multitude of conversation that so produces an idea about something, but actually articulating exactly what that is might not necessarily be the easiest thing to do. It's quite hard because, um, you know, we didn't necessarily have a, a kind of a, a clear end goal. And so we went on a path to somewhere and made the wrong decisions. So it, it, it's quite difficult to say that uh, they're, they're kind of really clear mistakes because it's happened very incrementally and organically. And, and so if we'd made different decisions, we probably just would have ended up in a different place. Um, but a lot of the kind of like mistakes are ones where, you know, we've learned, <laughs> learned how to do something better from doing it. And a lot of them haven't necessarily been, you know, design decisions or big like problems with projects, but kind of super small things like not getting the right events license in time. And, you know, it's just those small things that you sort of work, remember that, like, running types of work we do necessitates, you know, like, being involved in a lot of different other, other areas. I uh, think... But they're not, I mean, they're not mistakes, probably, in the way that <laughs> you're sort of indicating. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've just, we've, we have learned a lot through, you know, through doing things that haven't worked out yeah. exactly as planned. Um, but then obviously it's very useful to learn those lessons. Um, so, yeah, I think certainly in relation to kind of one of the first kind of um, bigger projects that we did in, in New Addington, which is the kind of where we were, we were staying in residence in this kind of suburb of London, um, redesigning and kind of redeveloping the town square. And we had this proposal to um, to have a, have a kind of week-long series of events, uh, prototyping what the changes to the square could be, um, which we built at one-to-one -one using kind of um, like staging and other things. And I suppose we entered into that whole situation with a, with a less nuanced idea about how you work with a particular community and situation. And I think, uh, it, it was an enormous, you know, it was, it was over, overwhelmingly like a kind of positive experience for us. But it, it, a lot of things had, you know, their, their end result was, was very different to what we had expected. And we, we thought, okay, we can use this to kind of, to test out the material size of the design. and It'll be like a giant model. But actually, um, the things that it did, you know, the, the kind of, it were, were more about kind of inviting other unexpected um, uses and activities and giving them a kind of greater visibility. Um, so I think, you know, each, each one of those kind of lessons that we've learned through, through projects has been hopefully applied to the things that we've done since. So it's kind of been a good, you know, good set of mistakes to have made. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they're all very difficult, yeah. but I mean, that's part of why they're rewarding. You know, they're, they're a challenge. Yeah. Um, and we tend to have, have not accepted projects which seem very close to things that we've done before because a lot of the reason why we each as individuals take them on is because they feel like a, 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 a challenge or a, a new type of work to yeah. be doing. There's always that sort of like initial thing of if people are interested in it, then the project gets taken f forward. And I'm sort of always surprised when a project comes in and I'm like, oh no, that one's not for me. And then you, suddenly it's like, oh, well, this person, this person, this person have all expressed interest. And you're like, oh, right, okay. I didn't realize that, that there was an interest in that. And then, and then the kind of second phase when you find out more about a project is a kind of question of, 
why are we doing it, like Assemble? So not just those people, but why is this going to be interesting for us as an office? And some projects don't pass that test and fall, fall away and some kind of continue, or we try and reorient them to be more interesting to us. I think that's quite good in the type of people who will seem to want to work with us or approach us and the type of work we go for is um, sort of based on the fact that we've sort of created an agency for ourselves to be able to influence the kind of the brief level of designing a project or at least being able to question a client or or kind of a user or whoever about what the purpose of the project is and and kind of that's that's quite a useful thing to be able to to do which you don't normally get the opportunity to, to kind of have a say um, in that. A project that we've turned down. Well, I mean, there have been <laughs> there have been loads of, of really exciting sounding projects that we've had to turn down. Yeah. Um, because you know we're very aware that we have you know limited time and resource, and the 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 main thing that have made you know successful projects a, a success has been being able to invest time and attention and energy in them. So we're very wary of kind of over committing and spreading ourselves too thin. There have also been you know lots of kind of more unexpected offers, and and I think. Um, it's it's great joy to work in a group where there's not a kind of imperative to to take on as much work as possible and to you know to, to make as much money as 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 is possible, but to take a kind of a, a long term view on kind of just can having the opportunity to continue to do um, kind of exciting work. Yeah, but I mean, a lot of projects get turned down, be yeah, because of sort of super boring things. Like they're great projects, but it's just not going to work out time-wise. And you sort of always end up saying to people, like, keep in touch. <laughs> we want to continue this conversation. And usually something comes back round as well. So I think turning down a project doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to happen. And projects are never really presented to you, like ready to go. Usually, then also maybe someone goes away and. It doesn't work out for them either, and the same project comes back like at a later date when actually it is a better time. So, yeah, to be able to, you know, not to be too paranoid about like letting a project, a really great sounding project, go. Like, it's okay. There's going to be more work. Um, so things like that, I suppose, get discussed at the Monday morning meetings. If there's like a particular concern that we have, you know, for like that we're collectively taking on too much work or um, anything like that. But then, so Alice and James are a kind of uh, HR. <laughs> yeah, f formally responsible for kind of um, with that. yeah, kind of making sure that there's a balance. And again, you know, it's a it's a it's it's an unpredictable thing with 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 jobs that rely on different, so many different partners and funding and things to happen, um, you know, exactly knowing when work happens and things that you think will, will start in six months' time actually, you know, start tomorrow and, and vice versa. So there's always a bit of a, a, a juggling act going on. I think yeah, we're 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 really interested in in the the, the larger issues, um, and the possibility of kind of 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 kind of um, being involved in conversations and projects at the scale of like large buildings and neighbourhoods and things. But I think it's important that you know we definitely see that as, as a as a conversation that w that w that we want to be part of, but not like singularly responsible for. And certainly the work in um, in, in, in Granby, which is, is growing in scale and there, there's many different sides to it, that's something you know, which happens alongside the involvement of many other people um, based in Granby and also um, people who, you know, who, who are becoming involved through the work that's happening at the moment. Um, yeah, so I don't think it's ever kind of like 
well, this is what we do and therefore we should apply that to this issue or this type of project and there will be a solution. It's, you know, the world, I mean, kind of all the work in Granby, we've never done anything to do with housing before. And, and so it was a very much developing your own practice and your own way of thinking and looking at an issue by being part of it. And Lewis says of all, all of the rest of the people who'd been part of it for much longer than, than we have. And then, you know, there's sort of other projects that we have, like the Goldsmiths Art Gallery, which is, you know, for a kind of big university institution is a project about kind of culture, but also about fine art and um, has this kind of other side to it about being a public building um, for this area in, in New Cross and South London. And, and so that's kind of another <laughs> secondary set of issues that are also interesting to us. But this project is a kind of, you know, three million pound building renovation project. So it's very different from maybe some of the other work we've done before. But there's always this question of like, well, how, how are the things that we are, we know we're interested in and the experiences we've had before going to become manifest in this completely different and other type of commission. Um, I think there's an interesting role that like um, teaching can play in the academic environment in pursuing some of those those kind of broader interests. And so I think so. There's quite a few different uh, studios at different universities that people in assemble kind of uh, like run, which are all inter all uh, you know this year exploring issues of of like the housing situation in London. And that becomes a way of kind of... Extending thinking yeah. with a larger, you know, kind of external community than just, just ourselves. Yeah, and I think there's also certainly kind of moving from the scale of, of kind of building everything ourselves to something which is quite kind of temporary to then working on something like the, the houses in Liverpool. There's been a, a kind of rethinking about about how we invest our time and kind of where and so there are elements of that which are very very handmade and have a huge investment in them but then there's also elements which are very very standardized very pragmatic very economical um and so that there's some you know there needs to be a kind of a, a balance <laughs> um, so, so that's not actually a project that, e that either of us are kind of... And it's also kind of very nascent, like it's yeah, just yeah. coming to the, you know, first model has been made and I, I, we do have, you know, people in Assemble do have kind of quite particular and specific interests of their own um, and there's this kind of construction wing, <laughs> you know, a couple of people who are really interested in it from that perspective. Um, so seeing that project happening. And um, we work with a really great engineer um, called Structure Workshop who are, they do a lot of kind of art commissions and are very interested in, you know, kind of collaborating with developing systems and, and looking at, it's, it's, it's much more kind of engineering e project in a way. Um, but well, I guess it's just kind of, you know, very much approaching it from how, you know, how it will be built, you yeah. know, in the same way as the, yeah, the, cigar, the original cigar method. Um. Yeah, but so within Assemble, you know, we have so many projects and so many people that you inevitably become more familiar. You, you know very much the one you've worked on, but you become familiar with ones that you've helped out on a bit or that have been in the office so long, you've seen them so many times. And so, yeah, this kind of seagull one is it's almost like watching someone else do it at the moment, but you, you get dragged, <laughs> slowly get dragged into it. Um, so, so, yeah. It was me and Lewis talking at a party. <laughs> and then it all... Actual um, acts there. Yeah, I mean, before, before, you know, the Cinerodium happened, you know, there was six months of... of talking. Of, yeah, of meeting up in the pub and discussing where we might start and what we might do. Um, and, and I suppose it was probably the actually getting to the building site, which is the real... Is, is not, you know, is, was the real struggle, 
in some way. And not, not that it felt like a struggle, but in so many projects which you, you, know, you optimistically set out to do, um, that's the challenge, I guess, is just getting to the point where it has to happen. Um, and so I think that's where a, a lot of people have had yeah, their first and probably most significant um, <laughs> in, involvement. Such a long time ago now, I can't really remember exactly how it all happened. But I remember the feeling of like the cinema opening and this sort of kind of sense that it was all over already because we built it and it just never quite seemed possible in the one sense, but on the other hand, you kind of sort of believed it was happening because like you saw 19 of your friends also doing stuff so you continue to do stuff and then suddenly there we are with the cinema and kind of public and it kind of working um, and and so it's really hard to know like how that happened when you're there when you're opening up you're like well, what did we do like how did this start um, but yeah again it kind of comes about conversations like that act of just being present and having conversation and making sure that enabling that conversation, making sure that happens, was probably a collective effort, but the first single act that we all meaningfully did that, that got us to actually making something. <laughs>